I'm delighted to welcome Katie McLean to our meeting today. I first met um, Katie quite a number of years ago now when uh, Syrians began to arrive in our community and she was very much involved in the integration uh, of Syrian New Scots. Um, since that time, she's been involved in many different things, but working with Ukrainian families and perhaps more recently with asylum seekers, which has enabled us to cross paths once again, uh, following the opening of an asylum seekers hotel in West Hill. Uh, Katie's going to share a little bit with us um, this morning. Uh, and so I would love it if you would welcome her uh, as she comes to give her presentation. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Stella. Before I start the presentation, I just wanted to reflect on something you had said earlier about legacy. And it reminded me of, I, I recently sat with an elderly Syrian chap who's at end of life. Um, and one of the things we talked about was the fact that he had come to Aberdeenshire. It was his home. He knew he would never return to Syria, to Aleppo. He had left 11 of his 12 children behind. Only one had, had come with him and his wife when they were resettled. He knew he would never see them again. He would never see his grandchildren. He would never see, um, he had been a vegetable street seller in Aleppo. Um, he would never see the streets he loved. Most of them didn't actually exist anymore. Um, but he was so content. He was so settled, so honest in his, his, his place of where he was now. And I, I asked, you know, can you share some of that with me? When I when I think of all of the different elements of my life that are important to me, why are you so calm and so accepting? And and his answer was around his faith. His his answer was around his faith and the future. And for refugees, resettlement is all about the future. It's not about the path. They don't have choices. For most re refugees, they can't return to the countries they've come from. So they can't think, they can consider the past, but it can't be part of their legacy moving forward. It's all about where you go from here. And he was content, his son is now at Aberdeen University studying engineering. Um, things were happening in his life. He could see a future and his faith was enough for that, the future that he was giving his son. And it's just a, a big lesson, I think, for all of us to learn in that. Thank you for inviting me this morning. I'm always slightly intimidated following Stella because she's such a wonderful speaker. Um, then uh, yeah, I, I instantly begin to hear my Glaswegian tones that aren't quite as silky smooth as Stella. So I hope I don't bore you. I'll try and keep you engaged. Um, when, when Stella asked me to do this presentation, it's always really difficult. I don't know who everybody is. I don't know what your experiences are. I don't know what you know. And I always find it very difficult talking about refugee and asylum work without really telling the story that leads up to it. If I just present you with facts, it can sometimes feel a wee bit sporadic. So if you can bear with me, what I would like to do is just explain the story for, obviously from my perspective, Aberdeenshire Council, but I have been thinking about the whole of the North of Scotland in that because I work very closely with all of my colleagues um, in Highland and Orkney and Shetland and Western Isles and the city and Murray and elsewhere. So we've worked very closely together. I am thinking about all of you when I was putting this together. But I think it would be good to tell you the story of where, where this work started for us in the north of Scotland and where we are now. And where we are now is in a very, very different position. We can't compare it to where we were seven years ago. Politically, when I started doing this work, um, Refugee and asylum work really wasn't on an agenda as such. Now, I think you would probably find if you opened up any newspaper, clicked any link in social media, the first thing that you see and you hear and you read about is immigration and asylum seekers. So we really, and it's not necessarily in a welcoming sense. So we're in a very different place now. And I think it would be good to try and explore a wee bit about how we've moved from there. Um, I would also like to maybe to, to explain a wee bit about the difference between a refugee and asylum seeker. There is no difference in the person, there is a difference in the status, so the status of the person. And lastly, just to touch on integration, because I think that's probably the main part of our discussion today is about what does integration mean in terms of people who are coming um, from other communities? What does that mean to us? Lots of people have different definitions of integration. Um, and I think it's always good to personally reflect on what you think, what we do, what choices we make 
around integration, not necessarily waiting for somebody else to do something. So that, that with the sum and total of our presentation this morning. I am going to go on for about 20 minutes. If you're like me, you may have a question and by the time we get to the 20 minutes, you may have forgotten what that question was. There is time at the end for questions, but if you have something burning that you would like to ask, then please just raise your hand and ask it. That wouldn't be a problem. We can make it more discursive if that would help. Okay. Okay, so it takes us back to 2015, which um, for some may feel like yesterday. For me, it does. For others, it may seem some time away. So eight years ago, um, things changed in the UK in terms of refugee work. So in 2015, um, the then Prime Minister announced the opening up of the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme. And that was in response to a number of things. We had conflict in Syria that had been on for some time. But it came to a head because there was a global reaction and a global response, and in particular to this image. And I'm, I apologise, I know a lot of people still feel this, this image is quite a disturbing image. It, it's a disturbing image. It never fails to upset me when I see it. I think, interestingly, that that image is still being shared, but we don't have the same global reaction. Just last week, there was more children and babies lost their life and were washed up in Mediterranean beaches. We no longer see these pictures in our media. But this particular one did. It hit every media, every country. Um, it, it was the sad death of Alan Kurdi and his family, um, who were Syrian. Uh, they had been fleeing, and actually they were, they were in Turkey. They had already left Turkey but were unable to then be resettled from there and were trying to leave the beaches of Turkey to try and move to another country so that they could be resettled. And that's where their, their boat sank in Allen um, and some of these family lost their lives. So that global reaction, that global response opened up the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Scheme. And it was the first time in Scotland that all 32 councils in Scotland then said, we will be part of a refugee resettlement scheme. And that had never happened before. We'd never had that universal response to, to refugee resettlement work. Up to then, there were very few refugees in Scotland. We'd had small, um, small projects like Vietnamese, but refugees, people had come through Kosovo, um, but nothing universal, nothing big. So it was quite a change for Scotland. It was a bit about identifying and, and, and then beginning to think about what does that mean when we're welcoming refugees into our communities. So when, we, when we're applying to do this, um, and I, I also think back to 2016 when, when Stella, Tony, um, Shuna and some others, when we first met, um, it was very much a humanitarian response. Some of us met at airports when families were arriving, others shortly before and after in terms of planning, how do we help people? How do we house them? How do we close them? But we realized very quickly that we needed to put good governance in place, that if we didn't have structures around refugee resettlement, it would always be seen as being helping out, doing goodwill. And all these things that are good, that what's important is you have proper structures in place, that you're clear about what your offer is for people who are fleeing violence and conflict. The very beginning, that was very much humanitarian led. Stella was one of our, our biggest voices, as was Tony, in terms of ensuring people had what they needed when they arrived. They had donations, they had toys for their children. As that developed over the next few years, it became much more about that. It became about ensuring people's rights and entitlements were made. People had a voice making sure that if people were victims of hate crime, that was addressed. So that governance by having all of these par par these different uh, partners together, I won't list everybody, and I think the copy of the presentation would be available if anybody needed it. So there's maybe lots of detail there that I won't go into, but you can see the types of people that were around the table and how they all played an important part in, in planning around refugee resettlement. So our Syrian scheme was the first scheme. Um, in Aberdeenshire, we settled around 220, 230 people. Most local authorities, that vary depending on the size of the local authority and the scale of the resettlement team. We have the, the Habab family here who were one of the first to arrive. And this is a picture just taken two weeks ago. They sent me and gave me permission to share, and that's them becoming UK citizens. So they had gone through the refugee process. They had gotten definitely to the main after five years. They waited another, another year. They did their English classes. They studied their life in the UK test. And if anybody has ever looked at the life in the UK test, I have failed it six times. I do not know the rules of cricket. I can't tell you which king came after which queen. And, and also things like what is the most popular dish in, in England 
in 1943, the time, you know, things like that. I put three benches high, I don't, I don't know. So a lot of the questions are very obscure. They passed their life in the UK test. Um, and that's them, that was them actually getting their citizenship certificates at Gordon House in Inverurie, which is lovely. So the Syrian scheme in a whole worked really well in most local authorities. Um, in, in Aberdeenshire, recently we just did a wee check-in and we found that 98% of the families that we resettled um, have actually stayed within Aberdeenshire. So I think that's a good indicator that people feel settled. They feel that is their home, they feel integrated. They don't feel that they have to be moving somewhere else to be part of a wider faith community or a wider Syrian community or elsewhere. So on a whole, the Syrian scheme, you know, we think has worked well. The thing that made it work was we were given funding, which the funding for our refugee resettlement team allowed us to work with people, to virtually take them from aeroplanes, take them home, in some cases show people how to use things like a cooker. If they had come from a rural part of Syria, they had never used electrical goods, um, through to how to top up meters, all the things, simple things that we take for granted that we learn seep into our brains. You've got to teach people from, from beginning to end, and that's worked really well. So the Syrian scheme it's such closed in 2020 was about to be launched by a replacement scheme, and of course we all know what happened in 2020. We're not going to talk about that today, um, but what followed on from 2020 was the, the opening up of a new scheme called the United Kingdom Resettlement Scheme, so the UKRS scheme. And the theory about the UKRS scheme is that it would be a global refugee resettlement scheme. It wouldn't just be about Syrians, but it would be open and flexible enough to react to any large-scale conflict, war, even environmental disaster, anything at all globally, that anybody could then be part of that United Kingdom resettlement scheme. It didn't get to a good start because of COVID. We did still resettle during COVID, which was very difficult, not to the same scale, but we did manage to keep going with very urgent medical cases. And that's the thing with refugee resettlement. Um, I think the last figures were around, in the region of 65 million people are currently registered as refugees. But out of that, the numbers of people who get it settled are tiny, really, really tiny. And how you are chosen for refugee resettlement is usually about vulnerability. So the UNHCR, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, will assess. And if you're deemed to be at high risk or vulnerable, you will be prioritised. The reality for most refugees is they're already very vulnerable. They've already lost their homes. Most people have lost family members. But over and above that, the type of vulnerability would be if there was a disability in the family, a child with a serious medical condition, people with terminal illness, maybe a mum on her own with children whose husband's been lost or imprisoned. So people with additional vulnerabilities would be prioritised. So the UKRS was the same. The UNHCR would then assess people. And this meant potentially we could have people from all over the world. Um, the programme itself, if you look at the national data, hardly anybody has been resettled through this programme. And there's a number of reasons for that. One, COVID was the beginning of it, and then our Homes for Ukraine programme last year tended to divert resources. But it really is quite shameful how few people have been resettled in the last few years. And we're not short of conflicts. We're not short of disasters. We're not short of war. So we, one of our hopes is that from this year onwards into next year that we put more pressure on our colleagues in government and elsewhere to get more UKRS resettlement happening. In Aberdeenshire, we are now bringing families in again more regularly. We had a Somali mum and her two children arrive a few weeks ago. Um, and the children, one of the, the girls already is in rainbows, so that's a good start. Um, good indicator of integration once you're in rainbows, they'll never let you go. Um, and we had last week, we had an Afghan mum arrive um, again, another single mum with her children. So that UKRS programme is beginning to happen again, which is positive. The next big resettlement programme that kicked in, so so far Syrian scheme, but that one shut, UKRS is still open, was around Afghanistan. UK government had already decided that there were a number of people in Afghanistan who would need to be given permission to come to the country before troops withdrew from Afghanistan. Unfortunately, there was a delay in this happening. The settlement teams like ourselves were urging the government to start removing people who were entitled to come to the country from early January 2021. 
and there was a delay in that happening. And then we all know what happened in August, the fall of Kabul, and then the chaos and the disaster that then happened within Kabul in terms of Operation Pitting and bringing people out of the country, which then became very chaotic. The Arab programme, which was the Afghan Interpreters programme, and then the Afghan Citizens programme were then started. Um, and a commitment made to resettle people via both of these programmes. The Afghan, both programmes, again, have become very problematic. There was a delay in bringing a lot of people. Some people who were brought were then placed into hotels rather than in houses. And, and some people have just recently been evicted from um, hotels with Afghan families. So it, it's, it's been another complicated programme. There's also a, a, a delay, a lot of people in Afghanistan who had worked for the British government, who were at risk, death threats from the Taliban, actually moved to bordering countries, most went to Pakistan. We are still trying to bring a number of families from Pakistan that we have their families in Aberdeenshire. So for instance, one family in Peterhead they got separated at the airport and half the family got out and half the family got left behind. Two years on, we're still trying to get the other half of the family here. They're now in Pakistan, but they're not safe. They have no money. They're not entitled to work. They're not entitled to do anything. We have a house for them now, besides where the mum and dad and everybody else is, and we still can't get the right visas in place to bring them there. So still huge complexities around the Afghan programme. And people who had worked for our government, for us, for long periods of time, who had dedicated, they had assumed that there would be a relationship beyond that. So still a very complex and messy programme, but one that we are continued to and committed to, um, and still trying to bring Afghan families in. Very different demographic from the Syrian families. A lot of the Afghan families that come um, are highly educated, they're qualified. They were working as interpreters, but they weren't interpreters. They were engineers, they were doctors, they were in all sorts of different professions. But because of their academic record and their English ability, they worked with the UK government. And it's a very different experience then coming and finding that you are a refugee, that you're not automatically going to become an engineer again, that you've got a massive amount of rebuilding to work. And then maybe the streets aren't paved with gold in Fraser Bra as much as you thought it would be. It's not London, you know, it's, it's a difficult one. So I, I would say that the process of resettlement for Afghan families has, has been tougher. It's more difficult for them, but um, the rewards are still there. And we're seeing a lot of families going on to, to achieve and to settle as well. But there is also still that issue around so many families being separated. The difference with the Syrian families is there was, I think there was more of an acceptance that they would never see their families again. The Afghan programme is more complicated because people were told family members would come. And I think when you live with that uncertainty, when, you, when you've been told, we will bring your family, and then two years they're not here, that almost doesn't allow you to say, it's time to move on because you're still trying to piece together what will my life look like here? So the Afghan, Afghan programmes still continue. Another big change, so this up to now, we've spoken about refugee resettlement programmes. Another big change was around asylum. And I'm going to explain a, a wee bit of difference about the two later on. So for in terms of unaccompanied asylum seeking children, so these are, these are people under the age of 18 who have arrived into the UK and sought asylum, but they don't have parents with them. Up until um, 20, Round about mid-21, the majority of these children coming in were in ports and entry points in the south of England. And it was recognised that that was a big burden for that particular area and councils to deal with. So COSLA and all the Scottish local authorities met together and agreed that we would take a fair share of so we could then support these children who were coming through as unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. So a percentage, so for all of the areas that you live in, um, depending on which local authority area you are, then a, a percentage figure is given based on the number of young people, children and young people you have already in your communities. So I, I think, can I put this, this together, slide together on Wednesday, we had 37 children that we were currently caring for, looking after, because we, we have them as looked after children and social worker involved in that. 
And then by the time I got here this morning, I think that number's gone up to 42. So that's just constantly, on a weekly basis, more and more children. Really complex area to understand why children travel alone. Some children come um, and their journey usually involves crossing at least seven or eight, nine, ten different countries to do that. Lots of debate as to why they do that. Some come because there is nothing left. They've heard about a place. They know somebody. They have an uncle. They have a friend. And it's a last hope. Others, it's not quite like that. Others maybe still do have family, but family that are living in the uttermost kind of destitution. And they think the last hope is maybe if I can get my child to the UK or to France or to Germany, they might have a better life. So that desire for their child to have something better. So you've got a real mixed experience. The one thing that, that unites all these young people, regardless of the motivations, they're, they're kids. And we all think for those of us who have children, we think back and the majority, we have some girls, but the majority young boys, we think how complicated 17 year old boys are. Sorry, chaps. It's not an easy time. <laughs> To manage that whole complexity of what's going on in heads and hormones, never mind on top of everything else, identity, loss of, of, of influence, father figures. So a really complex area of work. We're fortunate to have some really excellent social workers and family support workers that give these young people support. Um, and ultimately what they're looking for is to try, if their asylum claims are upheld, which in our case most have been so far, where they have been deemed to be um, at risk of, of persecution, then they then can settle. And actually, we, we thought that a lot of these young people would leave Aberdeenshire. They haven't. After they've been given refugee status, they've all stayed. They really like Peter Head and Fraserburgh. And actually, Fraserburgh, Fraserburgh Cricket Club are delighted because they're now winning everything for the first time ever. And I did hear the other day that they're about to have a second team. And of course, a couple of years ago, like a lot of sports clubs, they were really struggling to get one team together. And now they're having to have another team and they think they're just great. So, you know, Peterhead Football Club got in touch and asked if any of these boys had Scottish grannies, you know, because they were kind of hoping they would maybe get a wee bit of future for Scottish football as well. You know, so we, we see that fabulous kind of contribution in terms of, of changing the landscape of things. Big thing that happened last year, which I know a lot of you were involved with as well, um, was our Homes for Ukraine programme. So different, again, from the other programmes up to now, technically wasn't deemed to be a refugee programme because um, Ukrainians were issued with visas to come to the UK um, in the same way as you might be given a student visa or a travel visa. But they are refugees. They're, they're fleeing war and conflict. So that broad terminology would be the same, whether you were from Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, whatever. They, they're fle they've, they've fled. They've left where they've been because of uh, risk and, and danger to themselves. And within the north of Scotland, again, we actually found we had much higher numbers than, than probably other parts of Scotland because we had sponsors. We had people in our community offering up their homes. Um, and we saw a, a large proportion of that, particularly in Aberdeenshire and Highland, where people maybe had a bit of extra space in their home, a different de demographic to adult children had left. So Homes for Ukraine um, had a, a big impact in the north of Scotland and continues to do so. Um, again, a funded programme, so we were able to give a bit of support, um, but just the scale of it last year was quite challenging. So I think within a few months, I was saying to Tony earlier, within a few months, I think we, we had managed to resettle 700 Ukrainians. Um, and bearing in mind that it had taken us kind of four or five years to resettle 200 Syrians, and that's a lot of people. We weren't giving people the quality of support that we should have been, because, but they also had sponsors in their lives that were able to help them. We're trying to address that now more because now Ukrainians have been here for a year and a half. There are different pressures, much more self-agency, similar education programmes to us. People are very capable, very able. Because it's not a refugee programme, what we found with the Ukraine programme is most people left have been more able, maybe more educated, more highly qualified. Unfortunately, those who are more vulnerable haven't because it was more difficult for them to access the visa programme. So we don't see the same vulnerabilities in terms of disability, in terms of poverty, in terms of education. But the vulnerability that we do see now is around mental health and around that sense of people feeling what is still to happen? Where do I, where is home? And I think when the experience of seeing people with a visa 
is they have many more choices. They can move about Europe. A lot of our refugee families have no choice. They are here, they can't go anywhere else. Ukrainians are able to move all over. We have some Ukrainians going to Canada and then coming back here. But actually that ability to move about isn't necessarily giving them what they need because what they want is to be able to return to live where they were living in a safe environment. So they share that with other groups, but just a very different experience. Homes for Ukraine is still open. We're still welcoming resettling people on a weekly basis. But I think um, I, I think this, this time last year, we had hundreds of people still coming in. In September this year, we may only have two or three people arriving a week. So the scale of that is reducing. As the scale of Homes for Ukraine is reduced, the other thing that's happened has been wider asylum dispersal. And I think that's one of the key messages that I'd like to get across this morning. Um, and, and what changed within asylum work was most people entered the UK to seek asylum came through English ports. The numbers of people um, in that area was substantial. And again, there was an acceptance that the whole of the UK had to be part of the response. Scotland again said that we would have all 32 councils would be part of asylum support. And we sat down with the Home Office and agreed how we would do that. One of the difficulties around um, wider asylum dispersal, and, and you may hear figures quoted, I think the last figure quoted last week was there are currently 174,000 people with asylum claims in the UK. And we struggle to understand why that figure is so high. I don't want to get into the political discussion around that. I do want to get into political discussion, but I won't because I'll get into trouble again. But hardly any claims are being processed. And that's a difficulty. The numbers of people arriving into UK have increased in small boats, but actually if you looked at the figures over the last few years, there's not a dramatic increase because people have always come. They used to come through ports, they used to come through lorries, they came in different ways. So the figures aren't uh, are dramatically different as they've been. The difference is we're not processing claims. And because we're not processing claims, the number of people waiting for their asylum claim has got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're now sitting with this massive amount of people waiting for a decision on whether or not they will be granted refugee status and the ability to then go and work, which is what asylum seekers want to do. Asylum seekers don't come to sit in their backsides. They come to work. They have walked across 10 countries to get here. You don't do that and then sit down and watch daytime television. So people are waiting for that decision to go on with the rest of their lives. So we're in a really difficult position at the moment that that number is so high. It's become a political discussion. We hear it all the time. Um, and, and it's become a, a very confused picture. Because there are so many people here, then hotels are now being used to house people. Asylum support is a privatised process. So the Home Office procure mayors, a private company, to provide asylum accommodation and as asylum welfare. So that work doesn't sit with a refugee and asylum team, which is what we would normally do. Um, it's privatised process. We will still try and engage. We will still work with, with stellar communities and otherwise to do that. But the scale of the issue means that people aren't getting the type of resettlement support they really need. They're not getting the type of quality support, the type of information that will help them because the scale is so big. The other key point about asylum is we also talk about the cost of asylum, the cost of asylum hotels. Every, all costs in related to refugee asylum work doesn't come from domestic budgets. It all comes from overseas aid budgets. So every penny spent in this country on refugees and asylum seekers is taken from what used to be spent abroad. So I think the latest statistic I saw last week was that there's been a 55% reduction in UK aid spend, for instance, in Africa. And that 55% reduction of work around UK aid to Africa is what's funding um, asylum hotels at the moment. So if you unpick that wee bit of why do we need asylum hotels because we have a backlog and claims aren't processed and that money is then being diverted. This impacts on a lot of people in a lot of different ways. A lot of the projects that are then not happening in other countries are ones that would primarily be around poverty, they would be around women and girls, stability, they would be around water, they would be around health. So that vast reduction elsewhere, the impact of what we're maybe not doing efficiently here is then knocking on. The right to claim asylum, again, there's been a lot of discussion in the press recently about this, about whether people claiming asylum are illegal. 
1951 Convention. I won't read the slide because it's part two and I can't read it anyway. Um, but if, if, you, if you have a look or you want to Google it, 1951 post-war convention, that everybody should have the right to claim asylum. And that by doing so, you're not doing an illegal act. It came as a result of war. It came as a result of experience. The theory is you can claim asylum if you're not a genuine, genuine asylum seeker. Your claim will be refused. And then you, you won't be allowed to work, you won't be allowed to train, you won't be allowed to get benefits, you won't be able to do anything. About 75% of asylum claims are approved. The others are refused. At that point, people have no recourse to be here. If they choose to stay, they get no support and then they have to be able to make their way themselves. But not being able to work, not being able to do things, most people eventually leave. So with 75% of claims being, being approved, it shows that 75% of people who come have a genuine need for um, sanctuary. Some of the discussion again at the moment is that people should only do that if they can do it legally. There is no legal way to claim asylum. To be able to claim asylum, you've got to be in the country. The only way you can claim asylum if you're already here is you've maybe been on a student visa or a work visa that's finished and then there's something that's happened that makes you think it's not safe to go home. So for instance, recently we've had quite a few students from Aberdeen University that have been here on PhD visas and they came to speak to us about things that had happened within countries at home and whether or not they felt that that would be something that they could claim asylum for. We then referred them on to, to the various bodies they had to speak to about that. That's a very tiny number. The vast majority of other people have to get here. And if you don't have a visa to come to this country, you can't do it. And that's why people come in small boats, because they have to come here. Once they come here, they can then make their asylum claim. It is impossible to do that through an existing legal route. This picture is a lovely picture. It's one of my favourites is actually Sabir Zazai, a friend who is the Chief Executive of Scottish Refugee Council. And this was him getting his honorary doctorate from Glasgow University a few years ago um, with one of these boys. And, and fortunate enough, dad was actually given a visa um, after a lot of campaigning that a lot of us were involved with. So he came from Afghanistan to see his son um, get his doctorate from Glasgow University. Um, Sabir came to the UK in the back of a lorry. So, you know, he, he's a perfect example of somebody who couldn't appear. He was young, he was Afghan, he was being persecuted by the Taliban. The family had lost everything and they were hunting him down and dad had no choice but to say, you must get away, you must flee. He was a clever boy. He was only about 17 or 18. Um, he was a clever boy. He had taught himself to speak English and dad had thought, you know, get to an English speaking country. We sometimes think that everybody heads for the UK. The UK, I think, is about 19th in terms of countries of people actually seeking asylum. So most asylum seekers seek asylum in Germany, France, other countries in mainland Europe. UK is quite far down the list, but again, you would think if you looked at the amount of times that asylum is mentioned in our media, you would think we were right at the top, but we're not, we're quite far down. Being an asylum seeker is quite a different, ex difficult existence. You're not entitled to any benefits. If you're in a hotel, you get nine pounds a week. And that has to cover everything. You get your food paid for you. Um, you're not allowed to work. You have no rights beyond that. So if you want to buy yourself some more toiletries, if you want to get a bus somewhere, you've got to manage all that in £9 a week. So if any of you have seen Stella in the shops buying 50 pairs of men's underpants, I can just confirm now that what she's been doing is keeping the guys in the West Hill Hotel in dignity along with the other volunteers in West Hill, but they give them that extra dignity. Things that aren't provided by them, by the private welfare provider that are looking for after them, they don't give them that. They don't give them clean clothes. They come to communities, they come to other people and ask for that, which doesn't seem quite right. So being an asylum seeker is a very, very difficult existence. I put a link into Right to Remain if anybody's interested. It's a really good toolkit. It explains about the asylum journey. So there's some links here that you can follow in there. Being a refugee, and we have our, our lovely Hayat here, one of our Syrian women who became one of our expert airport arrivals whenever we had new Syrian families. Hayat would get our bunch of flowers 
and head to the airport and get folk off the plane and say, don't listen to the resettlement team. I'm in charge. Don't worry. It's going to be all right. It's going to be difficult. You're going to cry sometimes. You're going to miss your family, but it'll be fine. And we have a laugh and we have coffee. And do you know what? You're going to be OK. And, and Hyatt, along with some of the other women, radically changed our programme because they immediately linked it. They, they reached out to other people arriving and just gave that reassurance that, you know, it's tough. Refugee resettlement, brutal absolutely brutal there's no going back it's nothing nice about it but you know once you're here it's going to be all right it's going to be okay um being a refugee you have almost the same entitlements as us um so you can work you can study um and the most important thing is actually in scotland now if you're a refugee you can vote as well so lots of entitlements around refugee status so you can see how that allows people to contribute compared to asylum status where really you're in a period of limbo there's nothing else that you can do there so on to refugee integration um, these are some of the key areas around integration so obviously things that we look at laws health family employability language learning money and housing um, one of the biggest things is community connections. If somebody's not connected into their community, then that, that misses a bit of them. But how they are will differ from person to person. It doesn't mean to need to be that they go to all of the community events. How they feel connected might be very personal to them. And that's the interesting thing we can explore. I'm going to look at the computer at the stage for this one because that's far too small to read. Um, so in terms of integration of refugees and asylum seekers, I want us to reflect on us at this stage rather than refugees and asylum seekers. So one of the things that we need to do is actually recognise and celebrate diversity in our communities and not just say, oh, yes, it's lovely. We've actually got somebody who popped along, you know, and it looks really interesting. They're from the Middle East. That's not accepting and encouraging and engaging. That's tokenistic. Before I did this work, I was in education. One of the things I used to do was help schools prepare for HMI inspections. Which, yeah. I go, mm. yeah, and and I often heard some schools say, oh, do you know, we're really worried because we're not the school that we were. The reputation we had 10 years ago was so much better. And a school was only ever the sum and total of the people who were in at any one time. They may be different. They may have different skills. They have different strengths. And you've got to find that a community, a church, everything exactly the same. You cannot compare to where you've been. You can only compare to where you are now and then rebuild based on that. And there is a tendency, I think, certainly within the northeast of Scotland, that we have accepted a lot of refugee asylum seekers. We've accepted migrant workers. Aberdeen City is one of the most diverse cities in Aberdeen, but has it changed our communities? And I'm not sure it has. I'm not sure we really have seen a change in terms of how we identify as being, you know, in the northeast of Scotland or the north of Scotland, or anything else. I'm, not, I'm sure, I think there's an element of we're quite happy for people to be there as long as people are getting on with it, if they're working in our fish factories, if they're picking tatties, if they're fulfilling a role. But how much are we really taking in that diversity, that change in our communities? And how much is it changing us going back out the way? I see that more, and understandably in cities, when I go back to Glasgow, my birthplace from a long time ago, I see that there sometimes of the Glasgow feels very different. And, and the sense of identity isn't the one that I grew up with, where the only foreigners we ever saw were folk coming for Edinburgh for the day. <laughs> so I see that in Glasgow. I, 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 and I think it will take longer for us in rural communities and more in, in more northeasterly corner communities. But I think we have to personally reflect on that one. We recognise and explain our own prejudices, and this is a big one because we all have them. And it is that we, but I'm happy to be involved in this. But personally, the wee voice inside saying, yeah, but only to that extent. Or I'm still worried about like that. Or they're not really because. Talk about them. Ask questions. Own them. Have conversations. Be honest with yourself about the things that might be holding you back. No questions off limit. Finding ways to communicate. We have a drastic lack of English language ability in um, classes in the northeast of Scotland, right across Scotland at the moment. A real crisis in ESOL, as it traditionally is known, um, and people are struggling to be able to learn. But, but there's lots of ways that we communicate 
you can, again, Stella is behind a new language hub opening up in West Hill. She just tell me that 60 young asylum seeking men popped along yesterday, and that's volunteers that are running it, and they're just trying to talk to each other and trying to build that up. So think about ways that we can communicate. How can we open up our hearts and our heads to do that? Accept and embrace change. And I know that you're experts in that. I know that that's what's happening within the church community as well. But it is that embracing of it and trying to explore and understand what that looks like. And understanding and embracing the differences, the ultimate differences. Somebody will always be different from me, but you know, that's fine. That's still a sum and total of the community I live in. It's maybe not my experience, but it's equally as legitimate to mine. And I added, I won't go through, I added a few examples of integration about some of the, the, the other the clients I've spoken to. We've, I've, we've asked them about integration and people have said, I feel completely integrated. And somebody else would say, oh, I don't think he is. He doesn't go to any clubs or groups. He doesn't speak English. But his definition of integration is he's so happy. He's so settled. He feels like he's at home. You know, his kids at university or his daughter's working in the local dental practice. His English still isn't good, but as a family, they have a toolkit. They, they get by, they manage, they don't need us anymore. So that's, I feel integrated. Other people say, yeah, but they still don't come along to any of our clubs or they still don't take part in the annual raft race. So they don't do, you know, it's our definitions, again, of what we think integration is. We want them to be doing what we're doing, and then that's integration. It doesn't need to be. The integration is a very personal thing, and it should be about how we all feel and not necessarily about what we're all doing. We wouldn't be able to do refugee assessment work without the wonderful communities that we have round about. We have the Friends of Amal, a scale that supports refugee families in Baruri. And then most recently, the work that Stella and other community leaders in Wells Hill have done around supporting the young men in the asylum hotel particularly around asylum work, communities have been absolutely key. I've added in a couple of videos, which I'm not going to show, but these are words directly from people who have been resettled themselves. So Ali here, who came from um, Afghanistan, just talking about their experiences, how they feel now living in northeast Scotland. Six months on. And then finally, just some contact details that if anybody wants to get in touch to ask more questions or have any suggestions, anything at all, then please do so. Uh, thank you so much, um, Casey, um, not just for what you have presented us with um, this morning and, and kind of taking us through that scope, um, um, but thank you for the passion uh, that you bring to the work um, that you do and, and kind of picking that up and how that's changed and developed over eight years yeah. uh, and being able to support uh, lots of different communities uh, in facing this um, this challenge. Um, I'm wondering if anyone's got any questions uh, for um, Katie. If you have, I'm going to ask you to come and use uh, this microphone down here so that we can all hear it. So has anybody got a question they'd like to ask? Peter? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for a uh, very informative uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned about the illegal and illegal, which we hear the rhetoric an awful lot at the moment. And I guess my question is about um, the impact that that rhetoric has on families. It's easy sometimes to think when we talk about refugees and asylum seekers that we are talking about them and that for some reason they're not aware of the, the, that rhetoric. And people are completely aware of it. Um, I, when the PNG and other newspapers began to run some positive stories about when a young Syrian guy got signed by Aberdeen and was playing football, they, 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 they had a lovely story about it and every single comment underneath it was just horrific, just awful. And he read it. You know, and he came to see me and he said, you know, I don't know if this is worth it. His parents went, don't read the comments. And that's what I say to everybody, never read them. Don't, if, don't read the comments. I never read the comments on any news article because it's people tend to be filled with hate. They won't do that to somebody's face, but they'll put it in a comment. People read the comments, they know. And it's the same around asylum just now. Um, people that are, are, are coming to the country, when, when you hear some of the interviews of, of maybe people who are in Cali who are trying to cross, and there's been lots of really good um, BBC journalists and others who have gone over. It's a bit of time and embedded to try and get underneath the surface of what it is. 
a lot of these young people will say, we know it's going to be difficult, we know people hate us, they understand the political parties, they understand the discussion, but what are my choices? You know, I've, I've, we've made a decision to get this far, I, there's nothing behind me. You know, that my choice now, and it's that whole thing about when we criticise people, particularly women, for taking their children into small boats, and every single woman with, who has done that will tell you, I would never have put my child in danger if I thought there was a choice elsewhere. And they feel they're at that stage where there is no choice, and that's why they take the risk. It's I, it's a kind of life and death risk, a life and death choice they make. So people are aware of that, and that will affect their mental health. That will affect. So we really worry about the guys that you know in, in the West Hill, for instance, the guys are in Elgin, guys that will be getting into Highland and other other parts of the north of Scotland. We really worry because they know what's going on, they know what's being discussed. Um, and ultimately, they just want a decision made about the claim. Some of the guys in the West Hill Hotel have been in the asylum system for more than two years. And they've been moved around to different hotels, and they're just completely aimless. And how, I, what, this, and statistically, we talk about asylum seekers as being a danger. I don't know why there hasn't been more danger. I, I have so much respect for the patience and humility of people in the asylum system. But you hear very little. There's often within communities concern raised, perceptions of fear. If you look at statistical data, you are less likely to be attacked by somebody in the asylum process than any just about any other walk of life. So the amount of humility and patience that people have got within that and just having to wait and everything is difficult. And one of the difficult things is when you get an asylum decision, you also only have a few weeks and then you, it's called discontinuation. You're told you have to leave the hotel. So what we're trying to do just now is make sure that for every single person who gets discontinuation, we can then get to them to give them the advice that they need because what happens is people end up destitute. Because could you imagine we told you've got maybe 10 days to now find a home, to get a bank account, um, to find a job, to do, I mean, you know, it takes me six months and about 14 different lists and an ability to know how systems work to be able to do things like that. And that, again, it's almost an intentional push for people to say you've got very little time. And it's part, again, of this hostile environment. If we make it really, really difficult, hopefully people will leave. But the difficulty is if you don't feel you have a choice, then how do you make that decision? Thank you so much, um, Casey. Yeah, do you want to come to this microphone? Yeah, I just wonder if you can... Um perhaps say what the churches in local, in the localities can actually do to help, you know, provide a place for support or what, what are the needs that we can help to address? I've been asked that question so many times over the years and, and so many churches have been involved in different ways. And I think it's almost a, it, it, it's, it's not, um, it's not fluid. <laughs> So it's not always so, it, it can be, initially it can be Stella and her underwear buying, you know, it can be very much that ultimate basic need stuff. Um, and as more asylum hotels open, then it could be that we will, and my colleagues elsewhere will come chapping and saying, there's a hotel opening in such and such next week, can you help us out? So that very, very clear crisis response the difficulty we have with that is we, we've now been told by the Home Office we have 173 men in the West Hill Hotel um, and to save money, and remember this is from the overseas aid budget, they're now going to put strangers in bedrooms together, so that's going to double. So Stella is now going to have to buy double the amount of underpants. You know, it's just not sustainable. I went to Dundee to buy underwear earlier this week just because I was getting a reputation at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> So it is moving about now. So if you see her in Elgin, then you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> With a brown paper bag. But you know, even for that, for churches and communities, then that doubling up. I mean, West Hill is one of the biggest asylum hotels in Scotland, but that doubling up in a small community then gets really, really difficult to react to. So I think there's a crisis response thing. And then there's also within individual communities, people have been there for a while, is they, I mean, when we have accommodation, giving people space. So for instance, church in Inverurie, I don't know if there's anybody here from Inverurie today, but the very, um, very beginning, one of the first things the church in Inverurie did was to say, look, a wee room at the back if you want to develop a mini mosque, um, which then meant at the time, I don't know if the men are still using it, are they? Yeah, they're still using it. 
Um, so rather than having to travel to Aberdeen for Friday prayers, the guys go into the room at the back of the church and use that as a wee mosque. And it's, it's just, it's always worked. Um, again, in Verruri, the Acorn Centre has always been really open. All of the different events, we had a fundraising event that some of the Syrian women wanted to organise earlier this year for the um, Syrian earthquake. Then again, opening up and allowing them to be able to run that type of fundraising event. So I, I think there's it will happen at different times and different stages. Um, the majority of refugees in certainly in north of Scotland are Muslim, um, but they, they they come from countries where they actually I have more of an issue around religion because I grew up in Glasgow than they have. You know, and it's really, and I don't mean to be funny about that, but the sectarianism I experienced as a child with a, a mixed marriage, um, you know, then my my experience is understanding of that. When I speak to Syrian families about that, they were horrified and said, we, we grew up hand in hand with Christians together and Muslims, and actually being a Christian in Syria meant you had to be far more pious in some ways because you have to fast more and you have to do, being a Muslim is, looks great <laughs> compared to, you know, you don't actually have to do that much. So that, that sense of faith is quite fluid as well. So I, I think one of the biggest things is about talking to each other. For a while, I was doing a lot of um, talks to women's guilds or, or volunteer groups and stuff in churches. And what I used to say to them is the biggest thing you can do is every time you hear a, a horrible story, every time somebody tells you that, oh, I read in the paper, go and fact check it and say, do you know, I don't know if that's true, or I don't know, let me go and check that out, because I think that's probably collectively the biggest thing we could do is to try, and, and things don't always go well. There's lots about refugee and asylum legislation that we won't agree on, but let's make it accurate. So I think that individual responsibility and individual leadership, it might not always be about our churches or our fundraising or our donations, but that individual leadership, that when we hear things constantly dripping through, that we think, well, I'm not sure about that. I'm, I know somebody, I'm going to send them an email and see if we can find out some facts or a link to something and just try and correct the narrative. Um, I know that there's a, a, a number of um, churches, you want to come up with it? There's a number of churches uh, and communities involved around this um, work. And one of the things we'll take from today is to gather in uh, how you can get involved with that. Because um, I know, for example, we, we would love some extra clothing. Um, there's obviously a lot of people who've arrived in Aberdeen. Um, Patricia Finlay is very um, actively involved in work. Uh, and I know other congregations as well. We will gather that together and circulate it in our yeah. press retreat because you may find that there's something quite close to you and um, that you're able to help with within uh, your own community yeah. uh, or as a church. Yeah. Thanks, uh, George, for coming from Old Martha. Thanks very much, Katie, for your presentation today. I mean, it's um, deeply emotional hearing all this. But I just wonder, yes, we can do a lot practically and we've talked about many things that can be done. But I'm just wondering if there's some way we can address um, without being political, with a, yeah. in a party political sense, yes. but in terms of addressing things at a national level. I mean, we, the rhetoric, you know, we hear is just so um, desperate, isn't it? And I was hearing that um, uh, a number of them, um, people get moved around, um, you know, they, they're not allowed to stay long in one place simply because the policy of government is for people not to feel settled. That's right. And th th that just sounds, that is dreadful, isn't it? you know how are we welcoming people in, in that way so i just wonder if there's some way that we as a presbytery should be perhaps thinking of how we could um articulate our concerns and try and make um you know some pressure at a at a national level so i mean perhaps you have some some advice for us but i think what you do have in terms of scottish faith action for refugees um and and still has worked closely with sabine who's just gone to maternity to leave but Scottish Faith and Action for Refugees has been very vocal. So it's maybe about understanding more, and that's maybe part of that network, Stella, that you were talking about, and we'd be happy to connect with that. But I can also collect the councils to that, so we've got a conduit for all of the different councils and that church network as well. But it's maybe more about local presbytery feeding up to Scottish Faith and Action for Refugees, saying this is what we're experiencing on the ground, rather than them just doing it from a a policy level or a strategic level, yeah. they probably, probably would benefit them to understand more about what's actually happening on the ground. Because part of my fear is that there are so few people engaging with asylum seekers because the way it's set up and also the scale, 
we're not getting the relationship building. And as you say, people being moved about is happening. So you don't have the opportunity to find out and for people to build trust. There's not that man's in kind of humanity to man or man's in humanity to man we have, that you then worry that you're not getting that full picture either. So yeah. Yeah, and so we can again build that in. Um, I think probably the things that immediately comes to mind is that we can always write to MSPs and yeah, MPs MSPs, about yeah. the concerns that we have. And I know certainly um, that's what we're part of being encouraged to do. There's, there's a, um, for example, one particular project at the minute is around how do we encourage the government to give free bus passes to those who are asylum seekers? Because, um, yeah, in my own community, nine pounds, well, that's one trip to Aberdeen and a cup of tea if you're lucky. Um, so, yeah, how can we encourage perhaps very practically so we can share that as well? Um, Bob? Yeah. This is probably quite a naive question, but I was thinking about your comment about the underwear and how primitive mm -hmm. and basic that is and how we hear about asylum seekers being put in, put up in, Four star hotels. How basic is the bedding? Or is it changed? Is it ever changed? Mm. I mean, I, I just sat, sat there and suddenly thought, no, but hold on. I, I mean, I did I did know it wasn't four star. I mean, I'm not that stupid. I know that the, the hotel is not running as a hotel, it's being run by contractors that are holding people. Yeah. But, but how basic is it and how basic is, is the food? It's a, it's a good question. And four star hotels thing isn't quite true because I mean, I, I think that's again is part of our narrative. It's a business model. So again, mayors are a private company. They are procured by the home office to find hotels. They will engage with any hotel owner who's willing to give them a hotel, regardless of whether it's a one star or four star. So they have a, a contract from the home office that states what they should be doing and it defines what welfare. It's not really being checked. Home office don't care whether they're delivering on it or not. So part of what we do is try to hold to account. So we meet with mayors on a weekly basis. If there are issues like that, we then try and raise an advocate on behalf. So where people end up can really vary from place to place. Some hotels are very run down and old. Some like the one in West Hill, brand new. The reason it's a Sam hotel is the business owner had nobody living in it and, and looked at the amount of money offered in the contract and thought, that's a great earner for me for the next few years. I'm going to make a lot of money. So, it, you know, it's a business helping a business down in this. Um, there is a basic standard allowed that people have to have clean bedding. We haven't had any issue, but they've not heard any. There are, um, there are complaints around food and about the appropriateness of food. I think at the moment within West Hill, there are 13 different languages spoken. So you're not going to be able to please everybody. There's so many different nationalities and they do try and, and plan meals around that. Um, the problem is... That, and, and particularly in the West Hill one and, and Aberdeen City, and they're bored, they're, they're, they're completely bored, they're lifeless. Um, and you know that if you feel that way, what are you going to complain about? So you might complain about but as Stella's point is at least if they could move about, at least if they could jump in a bus and go somewhere, or have a walk in a park, or go to there, or pop into drop-ins in different parts, and the city offers much more, obviously, within, within Aberdeenshire, then it would minimise. So there are standards there. We don't have any concerns that people are living in really poor, poor conditions. And, and the anomaly now is we also have another housing crisis in the moment. We have a housing crisis in the UK that there is no social housing. And what's happening is, is when asylum seekers are then granted status, the first thing they have to do is, is present as homeless. And obviously with that, along with Homes for Ukraine programme, where we've had 20,000 people come into Scotland, all looking for housing, we have no housing. So even in Glasgow and Edinburgh, there's no private sector housing. We're seeing so in a wee bit of movement in Aberdeen, but almost not existent now as well. So when people are then presenting as homeless, what's happening in the cities is they're then going into two-star homeless hostels, along with people that maybe have drug and alcohol issues, mental health issues. So we're simply moving people through systems at the moment because we don't have the right resources to get them. So the contract is quite specific that there should be a level of welfare the, the definition of welfare is what we've discussed a lot because the, the, there's welfare officers. To us, we don't think they're looking at welfare. They're just simply making sure people are, they're not even making sure they're clothed. They're making sure they're accommodated and fed. The welfare officers are trying to find other things to do. They're just an employee as part of a big organisation. A lot of them have very big hearts and are trying to do a, a, a good job, but they don't have budgets. They don't have resources. So they're then relying on, on others to then deliver and that 
it doesn't seem if you want if you were in business and you wanted an outcome delivered your business to do that money is going from home office to mirrors but to actually deliver it mirrors is then going to Stella and others and that that's not a fair business model Casey thank you so much for taking time um today um I think we've got one more was there one more question no yeah yeah let's come out I was wondering if you're an asylum seeker and you're housed with a pittance, obviously, um, but you then decide to make it on your own and come totally out of the system, that doesn't work, or do they get involved with the underclass for want of a better expression? Can they manage to come back into the system again, or are they then penalised? If, if you're an asylum seeker, regardless of whether you're in a hotel or anywhere, it would be the same status and you would still be um, not allowed to, to work. There are asylum seekers who are supported, those that are given hotels. Some asylum seekers don't. So some, for instance, we have a, a young woman um, who was studying at Aberdeen University. Her, her student visa ended um, and she didn't want to return to Iran for obvious reasons. She then put an asylum case in and she's staying with a friend. Now, she has no recourse to public funds. She's not entitled to work. She's not entitled to benefits. She's not, you know, she is entitled to an element of health care. So she can, she doesn't have these things, but her, she's got a very kind friend who's willing to accommodate her and feed her. Most people don't have that. Yeah. Most people wouldn't have somebody who would say, I will take you in, in the same way as I do with my children and feed you and close you potentially for two years until you get a decision. Most people don't have the means to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so people don't tend to drop out of the asylum system. Oh. They stay in the asylum. And when you're in the asylum system, you have to keep checking. And people are so focused in under application. And that's why very few people um, commit criminal acts when they're in the asylum process, because they know if they do, it will be detrimental to their, their application. Um, so levels of criminality around asylum seekers is, is almost non-existent. There's small examples of it, but if you compare that to standard statistics it's it's negligible and um, thank you Casey so much um for sharing your expertise and is there I mean, a, a few folks have uh, asked the question about whether the presentation is going to be uh, available. So we'll, um, it, it, we are streaming live on Facebook. So we'll, we'll cut the, um, the presentation part out of that and put it with the PowerPoint, and that will be available on the, the church, uh, the presbytery website. In give us a couple of days or so to get that in place, but then you could use it in your congregations. Thank you. Great. Um, can we show our appreciation to Casey? Thank you.